Well, hey, howdy, hi. Welcome, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for stopping by to join me today. I really do appreciate it. My name is Ellie, and I am a witch. And this over here is my teaching assistant, Andy. And today is Sunday, and on my channel, that means it is the Cryptid Countdown. And today, we're going to be talking about the Cryptids of Colorado. So I'll be honest when I say that this week is all sorts of messed up. I was originally supposed to, and I did last weekend, go out and film <laughs> for this video and then the uh, video for tomorrow, uh, The History of Cripple Creek, and um, my camera corrupted all of the files, so I have nothing, and uh, I'm very disappointed in that, but I'm still gonna tell you everything. So there's that. So today and tomorrow, I, I didn't get the footage that I wanted to, that really sucks, but it is what it is, I'm still gonna tell you guys what's up. But I'm also not going to do a true crime uh, case this week. Um, so I was originally going to do Jeannie the Fairchild. But life kind of got in the way. So I didn't finish the script. So instead, because I didn't tell you guys about Ivan last week, because of all the brownouts and the storms we were having here, I'm going to tell you about Ivan the 6th on Tuesday instead of doing a true crime case. But yeah, let's go ahead and just jump into talking about the cryptids of Colorado. So the first cryptid that I have today is going to be Tommy Knockers, and these are small gnome-like creatures that are said to live in mines and actually aren't originally from Colorado, but were brought here thanks to Cornish settlers. Now this has been told in Colorado for generations, so it is well ingrained in Colorado lore at this point, but according to Cornish lore, these creatures are small, human-esque, and stand about two feet tall. They have large heads, long spindly arms and legs with wrinkled leathery skin. According to those who have encountered them, they wear normal mining gear and carry pickaxes. Said to be mischievous, they are known to play pranks. A common one being rearranging or hiding miners' tools so when they come into work the next day, they'd be frustrated. Though some miners claim that they have also been led to ore veins or other hidden treasure by these creatures, the most well-known trait of these creatures is that they will knock on the walls to warn of danger, specifically of impending cave-ins. In Colorado, the stories have changed a little bit as they were retold. It's believed that the miners who have died in cave accidents become these mischievous gnomes, warning their former colleagues of the dangers they could not escape. However, others believe that the miners' spirits are more devious than helpful, there to seek out revenge for the injustices that cut their lives short. There is more belief in the help that Tommyknockers provides, and you can see that at the Tommyknockers Brewery in Idaho Springs, Colorado. They use Tommyknockers as a mascot and have several adult beverages playing homage to the creature. Next up is Sasquatch. And I don't even need to say it at this point, we all know the show by now. <laughs> Being described by Coloradans as a bipedal, hairy, ape-like, part human, over eight foot tall creature that at times reeks. Sightings are mainly in Park, Teller Lake, and Laramere counties. It is so serious that there are signs leading up to Pikes Peak Summit that give warnings to be on the lookout for Sasquatch. There is a version of this creature that is not so normal though, and that is the Bailey's Bigfoot. This species is said to possess supernatural abilities and is able to use portals to transport from one location to another. The town of Bailey does embrace the cryptid, having a Sasquatch outpost museum that has casts of big footprints, as well as an in-depth history and a gift shop. Unfortunately, I had to learn to this museum after I'd already made plans to be in Cripple Creek, but to worry not, I will be checking it out soon, I hope. There have been about 128 reported sightings between 1926 to 2019, but there are still many skeptics, most claiming it is likely a human in a costume or bear, which are native to Colorado. With that many sightings, though, it is hard to at least join in on the fun, even if you don't truly believe. Next is the Vampire of Lafayette. Now this one is a little bit strange, and I don't quite know if it counts as a cryptid, as I, I personally wouldn't call werewolves, unicorns, centaurs cryptids. But this was cool and I wanted to talk about it anyways. Getting back on track. <laughs> this legend dates back to 1918 thanks to the Spanish flu. The vampire in our story is Theodore Glava, a tall, skinny, and very pale Transylvanian immigrant. As far as anyone could tell, he lived an impoverished life, making a living as a coal miner. Now he unfortunately died in 1918, one of many casualties of the flu epidemic. He was then buried, potentially in the same grave as another person, in Lafayette, Colorado. He was buried in the poor section of the cemetery, his gravestone hastily engraved with his name, birthplace, year of death, and a few various Romani words, one of which is Trandorif, which means rose. 
Now, it wasn't until after his death that vampire rumors began. Due to Transylvania being so ingrained in vampire lore, the words on his gravestone only help solidify the rumors that people have in mind. According to local legend, his body was dug up, and when he was, people claimed that he had blood in his mouth, his teeth seemed larger than normal, and his nails were still growing, which are all normal bodily reactions to death, so we're all aware. The townsfolk drove a stake through his corpse and reburied his body. Now, from the stake, a tree supposedly grew, and from his fingernails, rose bushes. There are still supposed sightings of a mysterious man in the cemetery, and if this truly is a vampire or simply superstition, we may never know. You are welcome to visit the grave still, but make sure you bring a coin, a trinket, or even a bouquet of roses. Next up is the Slide Rock Bolter. Now, you'll find this creature deep in the Rockies, though you don't want to encounter it. Said to be a massive whale creature with a hooked tail, it has a large mouth with rows of sharp teeth, its eyes survey their surroundings with a hint of malevolence, and can be found anchored to the sides of mountains by its tail. Stories of this creature come from lumberjacks in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The creature will stay anchored to the side of the mountain until they find something they think is prey, at which point they will detach and barrel down the mountain at breakneck speed, mouth open in order to swallow its meal whole. This is often the explanation for the devastating rock slides common in the Rockies. There is one story about a ranger who devised a plan to rid the mountain of the bolters. He created a fake prey using logs and clothes to create a dummy that was then dressed in typical hiking gear and placed at the bottom of a slope. Once the creature sighted the victim, it slid to the bottom of the hill, but once it had ingested the dummy, it realized its mistake. It was already too late as the explosives hidden in the fake victim had gone off. The explosion being so powerful, it leveled half the town of Rico. This may have been the supposed end to the bolter, but who is to say if there is any more still out there? Now clearly there are skeptics of a giant mountain whale. <laughs> a point against the story is the fact that Rico was not leveled by an explosion, but rather the buildings naturally decayed thanks to an economic crisis. With a range as extensive as the Rockies though, for those unaware they are about 3,000 miles or 4,800 kilometers long, you never truly know what might be hiding out there. Next is the Augurino. Now, this massive subterranean worm is known to love dry climates. As a result, it will attack dams and irrigation ditches in order to release water. Colorado is not the only state it resides in and is said to have an extensive network of tunnels through several western states. It supposedly lines its tunnels with a silica substance that reinforces the walls and prevents collapse. That is really all there is to the legend, though. There's no eyewitnesses' accounts of the Argarino. All that is known is taken from the mess and tunnels that have been left in its wake. Next is probably my favorite one on this list, and that is the Devil Ram. Standing at seven and a half feet tall while on its hind legs, this dark brown furred slender creature sports disproportionately long arms ending with sharp claws. Its head is said to be a goat skull, or closely related to a wendigo in design, with three sets of horns. Although it can be underestimated at first based on its slender frame, this creature possesses supernatural abilities, one being strength. It has been seen carrying a cow carcass across a great distance with seeming ease. They are also said to be incredibly intelligent and don't hunt or attack the same way every time as not to be caught. This is unfortunate for its victims as it has the ability to plot and carry out raids on villages and farms with mainly outdoor livestock. To have an attack by a devil ram is rare, but it is always violent and gruesome. These attacks are unique as well. Some of these attacks include stealing sheep or chickens from a locked barn by prying off the wooden slats of the barn wall and then replacing them after they had looted the place. Hiding inside buildings in order to ambush their victims. They rampaged a small village in order to cause chaos and unrest among citizens. They held a child hostage and ransomed the child for livestock. Now it has been noted that the devil ram does not eat humans, but has been known to attack and kill them. This leads to the assumption that they kill for the thrill or pleasure of it rather than out of necessity. A lot of what we know comes from assumptions or through observation exclusively, as the devil ram does not talk, instead communicating through bellows similar to that of an alligator. The legend of the Devil Ram is similar to that of the Wendigo, which is why it is also known as the Farm Wendigo. The legends begin in the early 19th centuries. As settlers began to migrate to Colorado, they were faced with harsh winters and food was scarce, so people began going to established settlements and begging for food and water. Unfortunately for them, the donations were tainted, and this is what started the changes in people. 
a primal urge was activated and they began to transform into the devil ram. Next, we have trolls, and specifically the trolls of Breckenridge for Colorado. Now, originating in Scandinavian folklore, these fearsome priesters have made their way to the U.S. and have been noted specifically in Colorado. Of course, most Coloradans know about the art pieces we have here. There are trolls in Breckenridge, Glenwood Springs, and Victor, two by the artist Thomas Dambo. Now, these are friendly versions of the legend and well worth a visit if you find yourself in Colorado and don't mind a hike, or if you have to be at Glenwood Adventure Park. There are two different types of trolls. You have forest or mountain trolls. According to legend, they are old and intelligent, but strong and have a proclivity for eating humans. It's also said they turn to stone in the sunlight, which is how a lot of people have seen these creatures. Legends have changed though, and they are also described as being just small humans, though they are still considered malevolent beings. You're probably more familiar with this type of troll as depicted in Three Billy Goats Gruff. There is not much else known about these creatures though. If you encounter a living one, you likely won't live to tell the tale, and if you see one in the daylight, it will not do you any harm. So yeah, that is all that I have for you today. I hope that you guys enjoyed this one. It was different um, when I went on my adventure, even though y'all don't get to see that. Um, I didn't see anything. I didn't even see a deer. It was pretty lame. I mean, maybe I can get my dash, maybe I can get my dash cam footage and put it in here somewhere, but it's, it's boring. It's just me taking a dirt road for literally an hour and a half. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it was a, a successful outing. I'm not normally one to go out anyway, especially not on my own, but I did it and I'm pretty proud of that. It's just unfortunate that I have no proof that I did it. Anyway, I also am not dressed like I normally am. Instead, I have a shirt that says support, support your local street cats, and those are not cats. So I thought it fit perfectly fine. But also, muscle tees. I think I'm going to start going to the gym. Uh, I think that might be what my TikTok is about, if anybody's at all interested in um, checking out my, <laughs> my fitness journey going from this to not this. So yeah, if anybody's interested, that'll be on TikTok. Hopefully starting next month. Anyway. <laughs> So, like I said earlier, uh, it is going to be a little bit different this week for videos. Tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about the history of Cripple Creek, and then on Tuesday, instead of a true crime video, I will be talking about Ivan the Sixth, which is another history video. Next week, it'll just go back to normal. Not totally sure what all the videos are going to be about. I do know, though, that the hist not history, the true crime for next week will be the case of Jeannie the Feral Child. I promise you that just, there was a lot more information than I thought there was going to be. So I overestimated my ability to get that script done in a week. So yeah. Anyway, I hope that you guys have a great rest of your day and I will see you tomorrow.